If it's too late to worry and you're too blue to cry, then get ready for Dr. Lori Roth. She's a Ph.D., black belt, host, singer, songwriter, mom, gun owner, survivor, and a red-blooded American through and through. From 3,000 feet up in the mountains of Washington, it's the Annie Oakley of the airways. Ready or not, here she comes, Dr. Lori Roth. What do rights look like in your world, folks? Should we have gun rights, or does that just promote violence in schools and with all of ISIS threats and attacks and now Ebola? Do we really need our guns? You you listen to the absurd conversations and debates that go on. Every time there's anything that has to do with violence or a problem or a national crisis of some sort, even if it's contrived, then they start in on the guns. We have a guy who tracks us. He's one of the high ups, the mucky mucks at Gun Owners of America. And so we have to listen, Eric Pratt. And then his bone marrow and genetics are uh, make you even listen more because his dad is Larry Pratt. And I've talked with him for years and years and years since about 1905. It seems like forever I've talked with him. On stuff, but Eric is in the same battle and in the trenches uh, with Gun Owners of America and trying to make a difference and keep our rights intact. Eric, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Lori. It's great to be with you. It's great. It's great to be have have you as, as well on. Uh, where do you see the battle lines being drawn right now? What What are the schemes that we should be concerned about or uh, plans by Obama and the left and the UN, for instance? What What are we not seeing? Well, the good news is is that uh, Congress is out of session, and so we can always breathe a little bit easier uh, when they are. But you mentioned the United Nations, and, of course, that is an, an ever-present threat. Uh, they now, sadly, uh, although not surprisingly, had enough countries to sign the treaty, so it will be going into force later this year. Uh, thankfully, the, the United States, uh, the Senate has not... Uh, confirmed it, uh, and it's a good thing. Of course, you know, here the treaty uh, deals with all kinds of handgun and semi-auto bans, gun registration, micro-stamping, all these things can come out of the treaty. Our concern is that even if the, the, the Senate doesn't confirm the treaty or, or ratify the treaty, that uh, the president would still take it upon himself to go ahead and start implementing the treaty, which uh, the, the treaty actually uh, allows for that. Uh, you know, certainly we, we can argue all we want that uh, it would be unconstitutional, and we think it, it would be. Uh, and, in fact, the, the treaty is unconstitutional, and there's certainly supreme, even Supreme Court precedent that uh, the Constitution supersedes all treaties. Uh, and so a treaty like this... Uh, should not be able to allow the president or any, anybody else to enforce uh, policies that run contrary to our Constitution and the Second Amendment. Nevertheless, uh, the Constitution or, or the, our highest law has never stopped the president before from grabbing his phone and his pen and just you know, writing in new rules and regulations. So I think that's the battle that we're going to be seeing is, is where the president is going to try to implement this uh, on his own, and, and that should be very concerning. Well, he's been doing that from the beginning, trying to bypass Congress using a czar's regulations, executive orders from the beginning, because he has no respect for our law or constitution of the House and the Senate. And But but now, from what you're saying, a, a, a treaty we've I've known forever, as you have, that it needs ratification by the Senate, and it's, he's not going to get it. But you're saying that there's some sort of wiggle room in the law or the way the treaty works or the Constitution works on the law that he can put it forth even though it hasn't been passed by the yeah, Senate? It, Article 14 of the treaty, and, and I'll quote this, it's brief. Each state party, that would be, for instance, the United States, shall take appropriate measures to enforce national laws and regulations that implement the provisions of this treaty. Now, in one sense, we're not a party to the treaty because uh, the Senate hasn't ratified it. However, as the signer on the treaty, the, we could easily see the president arguing, well, he has signed it, so he's going to go ahead and begin implementing it. And if you don't like it, uh, as he has famously said before, take me to court. <laughs> hey, hang on, hang on. We're talking. Hold on, Eric. I hear the music. We're talking with Eric Pratt, head of Gun Owners of America. 
We're talking with Eric Pratt, one of the executive leaders of Gun Owners of America. You all have heard Larry Pratt speak. Well, Eric Pratt is speaking, too, and trying to make a difference, and he is. Eric, uh, so, so this is something to keep our eye on, what the Obama will do. You think with with the U.N. treaty that he signed it, it does he won't get the ratification from the Senate. But as you said, since when does that mean a hill of beans to him what the law or the Constitution says? He he just flips it off and walks forward anyway. And then, as you said, uh, has this arrogant kind of middle finger. Sue me. Take me to court. And he knows people won't. And it, what, it, what does he think? Because he's half black, he's got magic or something? Is that the deal? Or he's just a narcissistic guy who doesn't believe that anyone dares come about against him for some reason? Yeah, he has really made life for us uh, very difficult these last six years because he has done so many things through regulation. Um, you know, we're constantly trying to fight these things. I mean, forget about trying to go on the offense and, and actually reclaim uh, some lost ground. We're, we're just trying to put out all the fires that uh, that he's engaging us in, including uh, his signing of the U.N. treaty. Uh, that's one thing we want to look towards is increase our numbers in the Senate to make sure that uh, it won't be ratified and then finally get somebody uh, in the next administration who will remove their signature. In fact, that needs to be one of the issues that people will be asked is, uh, if you are elected president, would you uh, remove our uh, country as being a signatory on this treaty. It's a very dangerous treaty. But, you know, all, all uh, you know, w- with all kinds of regulations, one of the, the more recent things we were fighting was Operation Choke Point, where, I mean, this was the ultimate attempt by the Obama administration to kill the Second Amendment, where they were putting the squeeze on uh, financial institutions to shut off credit to gun makers and gun dealers refusing to process uh, online sales and it was making it very difficult for them finally th- this came to light and we started really pressing uh, senators and congressmen to get a defunding provision in the uh, the continuing resolution uh, which we were able to do Thankfully, in other words, no funds can be used to implement Operation Choke Point, which is w- w- what it was called. Um, and uh, thankfully, the administration, uh, because of that, w- retreated from that. I mean, this is one of the, you know, one of the victories we've had. But you know, again, it, every time he's starting a fire, I mean, we've got to, you know, run over there and and, and rally either in. Uh, in the House and Senate or take it to court. And, you know, all, all this takes time and money. And there's always a lag. That means people are going to be injured. Uh, you know, people uh, with Operation Choke Point, uh, people are going to go out of business. I mean, th- this is the, the, the danger that we're facing, that even though we may ultimately win, thankfully, because we have a Second Amendment, uh, there's always a lag there. And, you know, people suffer uh, in, in the midst of that lag. Yeah, so so you're uh, dealing with, uh, okay, organize the deck really fast, shuffle the deck, but yet he's playing 52-card pickup, and, and uh, it's kind of hard to shuffle it when the cards are all over the room. <laughs> exactly right. That's Yeah, it, it's just one thing after another, and so obviously – uh, these elections coming up are going to be very important. And it's kind of funny because a lot of these senators um, on, on his side of the fence, you know, all the Republicans stuck together on gun control. Well, almost. Uh, there was a, one notable wayward one, and that was uh, Toomey of, of Pennsylvania. Uh, but the rest of them were really sticking together. Uh, but, you know, the Democrats were supporting his agenda. And now that we're here within a month away of the elections, and a lot of these Democrat senators are behind in the polls, they're now completely distorting their record. Uh, you have Mark Udall in Colorado, who is uh, golfing buddies with uh, President Obama <clears throat> and has voted uh, – in support of his policies 99% of the time, telling the people of Colorado, well, I'm really a thorn in his side and I'm his worst nightmare. Uh, you know, he's trying to distance himself from, from his record, so we've had a little bit of fun with that. Uh, it, we've uh, printed his uh, dirty dozen 
anti-gun votes from last year, and we have it up on our Facebook page at gunowners.org and, and also on our website. Uh, I'm sorry, our website at gunowners.org and our gun owners Facebook page. Uh, but Mary Landrew has done the same thing. She's trying to tell people how she has, and because, you know, look, Louisiana is the, the sportsman's paradise. And so she's telling people, I've, I've been there. I'm supporting your gun rights. Well, we collected her dirty dozen, and we've, uh, you know, putting that out throughout the entire state she's also behind she uh... she you all and several of these other uh... very liberal anti-gun democrats could be looking for new work come january and uh... and yet right now they're trying to make all kinds of excuses and of course this is typical washington uh... but uh... you know oh no uh... i was there fighting for your rights i was there mm-hmm. supporting the constitution mm-hmm. and so you know it's just uh... gives us uh... Uh, the opportunity to have some fun and, and give them the Pinocchio Awards. <laughs> that, that's a good name for an award, let me tell you. The uh, so, so it's not all uh, working the way they'd hoped, even with their money and their lies in the soundbite theater. People are starting to wake up from their coma in, in the country, you think? Yes, I think so. And that's um, it's always an exciting thing when you see uh, that excitement number one, but then uh, the disgust for the incumbents that really thought that there was a sea change occurring. Uh, you may remember after the, new, the very sad Newtown shooting, the, the tragic shooting, that uh, the entire media, well, the entire mainstream media was trying to sell the American people a bill of goods, and that was that the, the tide has shifted, that we are no longer a pro-gun nation and we are now ready to swallow gun control. And, of course, it was a lie. We were actually able to defeat gun control in our weakest house in in the U.S. Senate. Uh, But nevertheless, uh, a lot of these uh, senators, I think, um, they bought it. They thought, uh, you know, yeah, as a result of this shooting, now's the time. And they went out on the line and realized that... uh, the American people aren't behind this, and so now they're they're backtracking. Uh, that the governor of Colorado, who signed uh, just several restrictions into law, uh, a gun ban, uh, universal background, universal uh, registration check, and, and many other things, uh, magazine limitations, you know, on the number of rounds that uh, a gun can hold, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's now backing away from what he did, saying, oh, he was duped. He didn't realize what was in the bill. Oh, mea culpa. And, uh, but, you know, there again, the, the voters of Colorado aren't buying it. And uh, right now, he stands to lose his seat. Uh, already, Colorado has recalled three very liberal uh, state senators who voted for the ban. Uh, to be technical, they recalled two of them, and then when they got enough petitions for the third, she resigned because she saw the handwriting on the wall. But these were very liberal Democrats from very liberal Democrat districts, and what you had was the Democrats were crossing party lines to vote for the Republican. I tell you, you know, they don't realize how they have awakened the sleeping giant in trying to restrict our rights. I mean, when you even have a Bill Maher, who, of course, is that uh, really disgusting talk show host who's way to the left on every single issue, but when you have him rebuking fellow Democrats like Michael Moore saying, you know what, I'm not going to give up my guns. I have a gun on each level of my house, and I'm not giving up my guns, that tells you the problem that, these anti-gun Democrats have is that there's even people within their own ranks and you know I'm not saying Bill Maher is a member of Gun Owners of America I mean we probably you know don't even see eye to eye on anything related to the Second Amendment but other than I know one thing he's admitted he owns two guns one on each level of his house and he's not going to give them up that tells you the problem that, that President Obama has uh, and you know thankfully uh, we take great pride in this when he said uh, that uh, the biggest frustration of his six years in office is not getting gun control passed. Uh, we're very thankful to God that uh, he has had that that frustration. <laughs> well, he's going. He, you know, he may continue to fight it. I mean, he f- has fought it in the back window and underneath the attic and things like that. Um, when you when you look at Obamacare and the gun control. Uh, 
sneak, uh, like in a stealth way through the medical and mental health profession, redefining what mental health issues are a concern, even for our vets, so that uh, PTSD means your guns have to be possessed. So, so he has gone into some ground that to me was sacred as far as the the relationship between a therapist and their client. It is none of his dadgum business, and for them to be turned into spies and dare to ask questions that really aren't related to anything about guns or what you have in your house, wow. That, that, yeah. When that happened, well, that just about right. killed me. There's a lot of reasons for Americans to hate Obamacare. Uh, you know, the law is projected to raise the health care costs of millions of Americans, and I'm guessing more people have lost their health care coverage because of Obamacare than have signed up for it. Yeah. Uh, that would be my guess. But gun owners should be especially concerned about this law because Obamacare will allow the federal government to use our medical information, just as you were saying, to keep us from buying guns. You know, you mentioned PTSD, but people could also ask themselves, do I take anxiety meds? Or have I ever said uh, you know, to a psychologist, I've had thoughts of suicide uh, when I was dealing with stress at home or at work or because of a breakup? Or maybe you've voluntarily checked yourself into a, a, an institution to get counseling. Well, if somebody has answered yes to any of those questions and there's a federal nexus, you know, such as a military veteran or somebody receiving Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid, then you could find yourself disarmed in the near future under Obamacare. And as you mentioned, it's already happened to military veterans. More than 175,000 military veterans have lost their gun rights because of things like PTSD. These are guys who fought bravely for our country, they, but they come home deeply affected. And, they, and so now they've been basically deemed as mental defectives, which the law prohibits uh, those who are adjudicated as mental defectives from uh, owning a firearm. Of course, uh, it is a total fallacious argument because it's a, uh, if anything, it might be a psychologist saying that, that, uh, you know, that they have PTSD or are suffering from depression or whatever. So it's not an adjudication in the sense of, you know, somebody who's committed a crime and then they get off, uh, you know, serving serious time or the death penalty because they're adjudicated as a mental defective. That's what the law was supposed to mean, but it's been twisted by Obama and others uh, to mean, well, you know, if you're a military veteran and, you know, you're, you've got the shakes at night and you've got uh, nightmares and things like that, suffering from PTSD, we can't trust you with a gun. By the way, thank you for your service. Uh, hand over your guns now. Yeah, yeah, and, and the PTSD, when you think about it, they call things different now, and now it's PTSD. But what vet has come home from major... Uh, work in the military, World War One, Two, Korean War, Iraq, uh, Kuwait, uh, wh- whatever the deal was, Afghanistan. What what vet has not faced the enemy and and the blood and the horror of it, and not come back with some adjustment issues or depression or nightmares or PTSD as they would have called it back then? Uh, but but I can't find any stats or any facts anywhere that imply ever that our vets have come home with adjustment issues that are normal for anyone in any war, any battle, uh, that, that, that they were now magically criminals and going to go and rob banks or run into Columbine and start wiping out children. That is so absurd and so not a precedent in any of our history with vets coming back, even with adjustment issues, which they all have. Oh, right. why, why wouldn't they have them unless you're a non-human, unless you're RoboCop or you don't have a brain, you're not human anymore. Of course you're going to have feelings. You just saw people's heads blown off and legs amputated by your friend next door in the trench. Uh, you're not supposed to be affected by this. Now, does that mean you're not moral? Does that mean you don't know what to do with a gun? You don't know what the law is? Most vets I have ever heard of or ever talked with or ever read about don't become criminals because they have adjustment when they come home like anyone would. Yeah, and, you know, really the, the, the whole veterans issue is just the camel's nose in the tent. I mean, they're really using this to then expand uh, to, uh, to millions of people who are then going to be disqualified. I mean, when you have the CDC saying that nearly 50% of Americans will suffer from some kind of mental illness, see, this is just the foot in the door. Uh, I mean, who knows what they're counting. I don't know if they're counting caffeine 
uh, addiction as mental illness. Yeah, uh, they, they, they like to re- redefine what that is on a weekly basis, I think. We'll be right back with Eric. We're talking with Eric Pratt. He's one of the leaders of Gun Owners of America and fighting for our rights. And if you think that Second Amendment rights don't matter and we'd be safer without them, uh, then you obviously got an F in history and you don't read uh, what goes on when people can't defend themselves. And one of the first things Hitler did uh, was put forth Hitler's Enabling Act in 1933 and went after his own people's guns first. He knew that his own people, he didn't want them to have guns, his own people. We're not talking the Jews, no. He took all the German people's guns, uh, put out health care, and uh, started appearing like the Messiah, and he got voted. He got the Hitler's Enabling of Act voted in legally, and himself voted in legally. We forget history. We just think, oh, he was a monster. He was a deranged monster. No, he was an orator. He was a visionary. He was a guy who knew how to work the crowd and get the teens uh, to support him because he would give them soccer balls and snacks and treats every weekend. Am I wrong, Eric? I'm not. You are not wrong, and in fact, we even have that in our own history where, uh, you know, why did the colonists finally draw the line at Lexington and Concord? I mean, there, there were quite a few abuses that they had lived through, and, you know, they hadn't taken up arms to defend themselves. But when the king finally resorted to attempting to steal their guns and their powder, that's when they said no more, and they drew the line. And that was, of course, the famous shot heard around the world April 19th, 1775. But, uh, you know, and, and by the way, as a little aside, it is so sad how many kids in high schools today are not being taught that that's what precipitated the shot heard around the world in Lexington and Concord. I mean, they barely even know about Lexington and Concord, let alone what st- what, yeah. what led up to it. But, uh, no, you're absolutely right. Tyrants don't like the people having guns. It's that simple. No. And we dare not. I mean, if Obama comes out with regulations or requires because of a national emergency or concern that I have to come for your guns, I mean, we, we have to know our rights and our law and and the Second Amendment, uh, what it says, and stand on it, or or he will manipulate and think, well, just sue me in court, you know, prove that I'm taking away your gun falsely. I mean, we we can't submit to that, can we? And and he'd try to pull something. Right. Uh, no, no, we can't. And uh, I mean, history shows over and over just the danger in the people not having firearms. But you know, and not only from a government against the people perspective, but then just consider what a blessing it has been for people to be able to defend themselves. Just think of some of the, the stories from around the country, even just recently. You know, you have that uh, Muslim uh, extremist in, uh, in Oklahoma who uh, beheaded a woman and, and was working on a second one when the guy who owns the, the, the food distribution warehouse there uh he was also a uh, a reserve deputy but anyway he, he carries a concealed firearm uh well thankfully he had his firearm with him because he dropped the guy and you know this really exposes the whole foolishness of the anti-gun view uh the guy who actually started uh, the Brady campaign years and years ago it was actually called handgun control then. But you know, he said that when you're confronted by violent criminals, you should put up no defense, give them what they want, or run. Now, what great advice is that? Give them what they want. What about when the bad guy wants to cut off your head? Yeah. You know, like, like they're in Oklahoma. You're just supposed to give them what they want? Well, and Eric, wasn't it Biden, um, one of his idiot moments, which is every time he opens his mouth, but uh, him saying something like women shouldn't need guns, is really the way they can help themselves if they're attacked by someone or a rapist. They should scream or cry. You know, and, and the, I've heard several comments from leftists, scream and cry. And then another one said, well, she should have a whistle, blow a whistle if, like, Ted Bundy shows up. I'm going, okay, you're going to cry, and you think they're going to run away because you're crying. You're going to scream. You're going to go to a whistle box or blow a whistle, and magically the guy won't behead you or Ted Bundy won't kill you. I, I, are these people completely dumber than posts? 
They, they are, and uh, I would add to your list of, of things that uh, women have been encouraged to do when the, uh, the battle in California was brewing last year over gun control legislation, and, and many women showed up uh, to testify against the, the legislation that was working its way uh, through their legislature. Uh, these women were told, well, uh, in case of a rape, what you can do is uh, either uh, – Stick your finger in your mouth to force yourself to vomit or force yourself to urinate, and that will scare the attacker off. Oh! Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They'll be scared. They'll call to mommy. They'll be scared if you throw up. Oh, oh, my Lord, have mercy. I told your dad this, and I've mentioned this to my listeners a couple times. Um, uh, when I lived in northeast Portland, I had three other female roommates in a humongous, beautiful home in northeast Portland. It was a beautiful home. And I'd walk my dogs all the time, and I'd watch the news, and I was in the music business. Well, uh, I I noticed on the news a few weeks before this day came that there was a rapist loose in northeast Portland, like in a 10-mile radius, and it was in the M.O. of this guy. He would go up and ask people, I have a flat tire. Can you give me five bucks, you know, to go get get something or other entire or whatever? And he would go up to people, and he would get his victims that way. And I remember the day. This was like a huge four-story home, a huge home we, we leased. Well, I was coming down this long flight of stairs, and I heard Nancy, my roommate, at the door with this guy saying exactly the same thing the news said he would say. Mm. Well, can you give oh, me five dollars? Wow. I, you know, my tires flat and blah blah blah. So Nancy, very naive, sweet Nancy, said, "Oh, sure, honey, hold it right there, and I'll go and, go and get you some money." So she left and ran to get money, and I knew immediately my skin crawled, and I, t- I, t- I had a cold chill go through me. I didn't see him because I was way up the flights of stairs, another story and a half above him, but I heard it all. I ran back up to my bedroom. I got my 45, put the clip in it, and started walking back down the stairs with my 45. And I was about, oh, halfway down the stairs, and I turned the corner, and there he was, two-thirds of the way up the stairs, coming up the stairs. He hadn't been invited into the house. He'd come all the way into the kitchen, down the hall, and had to turn a corner to get up the stairway, and then halfway up the stairs, uninvited. And I knew who he was. And so... He turned the corner, and I turned the corner down the stairwell, and he was about 15 feet from me, and he looked at my gun, and I looked at him and looked down at my gun and looked at him, and I had it. I didn't say a word. I never said a word. He, uh, But I gave him the bitch from hell look, like, I will kill you and enjoy it, and then praise God, I will kill you so fast if you come. I, I had to make a decision right there. I thought, I can't let him closer to me because he'll charge me. He can grab the gun, so I have to kill right. him. I have to stop him, and I had a forty-five, and that's not exactly a BB gun, as you know. Um, so I, he knew, and and I looked at him, and uh, the message was clear, and he finally ran down the stairs and ran out, and they eventually caught the guy. Nancy comes, lo- you know, l- loping back after all this has happened, and says, "Where'd the guy go? I have his money." <laughs> Uh, honest oh, to Pete, no. I just but but you know I, I look I look back in my history when I was in the music business, and how close I potentially cl- came to a rape from that guy, mm. uh, and what would have happened if I would have come down the stairs with a saucer or a cup or maybe my Bible or may, may, maybe just me. What about my whistle? What if I'd have blown a whistle? Would it have meant a hill of beans? No, uh, that guy was looking at my gun. Right. Or, or how about, you know, NBC, the NBC Today show uh, just a couple weeks ago had a New York City detective to talk to people, uh, their viewers, about how to defend themselves. And his great advice, uh, what do you keep up there next to your bed on, on your dresser? Wasp spray. So imagine you're the same story. <laughs> you're coming down the stairs with your can of wasp spray. How do you think that's going to turn out? Well, and then if you don't have the money for wasp spray, I suppose you could just use generic hairspray or something. That's really going <laughs> to I mean, if help. it's such a great idea, why does the <laughs> NYPD carry wasp spray on them? I mean, if it's really oh. that effective, come no, on. No, but, you know, it, it's absurd that we're even having this conversation, but I do remember Biden and, and so many of these people, talk, uh, what, right after some of these, I think now, false flag event shootings, um magically they had these speeches on assault weapons and everything all planned. And, you know, if you have a rape, you know, I remember from my own experience 
thinking I'd lose my mind listening to Biden say, wait, just scream, start crying. Girls, just start crying. It has so much impact when you start crying. Really? Really? Well, you know, this is also, you know, Joe by a shotgun, uh, Biden. Uh, he, he did concede that, well, you know, while, you know, he, he told you, 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 you women can't handle uh, a semi-automatic rifle, uh, so just go ahead and, and buy a shotgun and, you know, just give it a few blasts through the door or, or uh, out on the balcony into the air, which, of course, is illegal in probably every single state, uh, the advice he was given. Uh, but, you know, for him to sit there and lecture women as to what type of gun they should use, I mean, quite frankly, uh, my wife would like to smack him because, uh, you know, she's, she's uh, shot fire um, uh, shotguns. And, uh, you know, for a gal who's a lot smaller, that, that is not an easy weapon to handle. You know, in fact, there's actually a very funny YouTube, uh, piece, uh, where women who are shooting shotguns for the first time and it, like, it puts them on their keister, you know, but th- that's actually not true of an AR-15, which is a very smooth, easy weapon, a, a mild kick. I mean, that's exactly what you would want to have for self-defense. So Biden just absolutely has no idea what he's talking about. Well, I'll tell you what, I am very, very supportive and very respectful of our vice president, so I may sure I have a shotgun and an AR-15 yeah, and a 9 mm and a One 38 arm, right? and a 357 <laughs> and I'm just ton- I'm talking hors d'oeuvres honey I'm talking hors d'oeuvres okay we'll be back oh please Eric in our final segment together today um what are some of the lines in the sand that Americans must be prepared to draw and if we all band together for people who have agendas to come after the guns or to take away our rights because they want to develop tyranny or dictatorship? And I think that that danger certainly could be the case could be made that Barack Hussein Obama may be one of those people. Uh, do we slowly give in to demands of regulations that don't make sense? or having to sign up or turn in or declare our guns. What, what about requests like that or demands like that? Well, no, and for one reason, that's why Gun Owners of America is here, and we have a, a foundation uh, which is also very active in helping defend people in court. Uh, we've got cases uh, before the, the Supreme Court. Uh, we're trying to roll back gun control laws. And, you know, we, look, we take the, the Second Amendment very, very literally. The, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And so gun owners, as, as you know, Lori, we have opposed every type of infringement, including uh, background checks, which don't stop uh, bad guys from getting guns no. certainly didn't stop Adam Lanza in Connecticut or uh, the Clackamas shooter because, hey, when they can steal guns, how is a background check going to stop that? No wonder that, by the way, police, by a two-to-one margin, favor uh, concealed carry over expanding background checks. And sadly, you know, now that uh, we've allowed them to have the foot in the door with background checks, we're seeing states like Washington, State and other states that are trying to expand uh, background checks to even include private sales, as you know. And so this this becomes very destructive. Anytime we we give up some ground and say, oh, okay, we'll give into that, and then they'll go away. Well, no, they, they never go away. They, no. they want to restrict the Second Amendment until, uh, it, for many people, it, it's uh, the idea that only the military or the police should have firearms. And uh, and that's the type of ideology that, that we're fighting, and that's yet just another reason why we can't give any ground. No, I, I I agree. And so what about the schemes that we've seen over the last few years on ammo, buying all kinds of ammo and distributing it through all kinds of government agencies like the post office and all the, uh, you know, the postal service and all this stuff. Uh, do you see any potential danger to Americans with all that ammo going everywhere? Well, it's certainly a danger when they're allowed to, uh, have firearms and be armed, and, and we are not. Uh, and many of these agencies, um, you know, Americans give up their rights when uh, they go to a post office or, uh, you know, a place like that. And, and haven't we seen over and over and over again, where do uh, 
uh, all the, the big public mass shootings occur, they occur in places that are gun-free zones. If you go back to 1950, there's only two uh, public mass shootings that didn't occur in a gun-free zone. So they've always, uh, with uh, the exception of two, just been places where people were not allowed to defend themselves, were prevented by law from defending themselves. Sadly, that even includes our military bases. Uh, where the, the servicemen aren't allowed to carry firearms. So, yeah, it's certainly very concerning. Um, you know, uh, if, if there's a silver lining to this, the, the attack on gun rights has really uh, forced a lot of people who maybe hadn't thought about getting their ultimate insurance to go do that. And so Barack Obama has truly been the gun salesman of the decade and ammunition salesman of the decade. And actually his uh, poster hangs in some uh, gun shops with that tag with that caption gun salesman of the decade so, you got it uh, you, you know, gotta love it uh I, I hear the music we ran out of time check out gunowners.org eric you rock thank you so much for coming on hey thanks so much Lori. it was great you betcha bye